Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session. Rumination with Andrew, thank you so much for joining us as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And um, today we are going to talk about an interview that I actually watched between, um, with, well, it was with Dr. Nigel Clark and uh, an interview that he did yesterday morning on Television Jamaica about his departure regarding his departure to the International Monetary Fund. And this interview was conducted by Simone and Neville Bell of Television Jamaica. And I listened keenly to what Nigel Clark was saying and you know about his departure and the fact that Simone and Neville Bell were just fawning. It was almost like it was salivating over this important uh, milestone in Nigel Clark's life. And let me just say that I do applaud Nigel Clark for his astute and his, uh, his astute career and also his brilliance, right? We can't deny that this is a brilliant guy who managed to have pursued a PhD in mathematics at Oxford University, went on a Rhodes Scholarship. So therefore, to some extent, he is a sort of role model. But we've got to be careful what we put up as role models also. We've got to look at people who have certain values, who are tethered to certain values, and values of standing up for what is morally right. And we know that he is going to an institution, the International Monetary Fund, that is not an institution that stands up for moral principles, right? They do lack a moral conscience based on what they have done in terms of destroying the global south and their economies. There is no success story from the IMF since its inception in 1947. Was it 1947 when it was founded, right? There has been no success story, right? All the major economies that have implemented IMF austerity have not turned out well, right? Things always worsen with these economies. So this is not something that is new and something that, you know, we can say that let's wait and see. This is something that is definitive and is a known fact, is an open secret. So I'm not sure why Jamaicans, especially in the upper echelon, are actually lauding Nigel Clark for the efforts of implementing austerity in the Jamaican economy. Right, because that's what, what he did. Both Dr. Nigel Clark and also Dr. Peter Phillips, they were just, you know, um, men who actually implemented what they were told. Severe austerity, economic austerity that came from the IMF that actually worsened the economic situations of working class and middle class people. And something we have to understand, we have to come to grips with. You know, and I saw Nigel Clark on the program lecturing Neville Bell and also Simone on the fact that, you know, this is a very important position for him. And he was also given or invited to have joined other multilateral institutions in Washington, D.C., three of which he declined. But it seems to me that he could not have declined the his, this proposition, this invitation to the, to the International Monetary Fund. So he has taken up this career and he is definitely heading there and good luck to him, but we can't really praise things that we know that really are not true because this is really an illusion to think that Dr. Clark was this great stewardess, of, well, not stewardess, but steward. <laughs> he was a great steward of the Jamaican economy, right? <laughs> it's not true because what we can say is that he was just, you know, a servant, a slave master, not a slave master, but a slave of the IMF. He's, he wasn't the slave master. The slave masters are the people in Washington, D.C. who told him what to do, and he adhered um, uncritically and slavishly to their commands in Washington, D.C. So there's nothing particularly great about Nigel Clark. I mean, we can't say that he stood up to IMF's austerity. That's why he's talking about the macroeconomics. But what happens to microeconomics? What happens to the building of hospitals and the building of schools, the building of roads that we lack in Jamaica? We're not seeing these things. We have become poorer since we went to the IMF. We can say there is some level of debt reduction, but at what cost? 
what has it costed the Jamaicans, you know, for reducing debt? Now, if we're reducing debt and we're not doing anything to grow the economy, therefore that that debt that we say that we have, you know, reduced is not going to amount to any long term growth and development because we've got to invest in our people. And for too long, we have not been investing in our people. And that is why we have the brightest minds at this moment leaving Jamaica. We need to look carefully at what we are talking about. And in many cases, we're just looking superficially at issues and we are praising people for doing jobs that is going to result in catastrophe, right? In a future catastrophe, in a future disaster. Now, let's listen briefly to what Dr. Nana Clark was sharing and his insights on television Jamaica yesterday. So let me share that with you so that you can see what the man, right? The Bay Metal of the Man is. Because we've got now to be more serious. I think that we are not a serious people. And I think that we're suffering from amnesia. And to a large extent, we don't read. We are not a reading society. And I will continue to say that we've got to read. We've got to educate ourselves about geopolitics, about the economics, about the political situation in the world. And before we even talk about that, I must say to you that what is happening in the United States with the presidential election is going to affect us also. And we've got to look at whether the Republican Party or the Democratic Party is more favorable to us. We know that they are two birds of the same there's two wings of the same bird, right? Yeah, so they're the same bird and two different wings of that same bird. But at the same time, we've got to look carefully, fine tuning with making comparisons between the, the, the leadership, the stewardship of the Democratic Party in relation to its foreign policy. We know that we've not had a great, you know, sort of relationship with the Democratic Party, especially what happened in 2010. That was not a very good relationship with the Democratic Party. And some people think that, wow, Trump is racist. But what happened when we talk about Obama and what happened to Jamaica and his sending of the troops in Jamaica? Well, he didn't send troops, but he actually used drones. And that is now something, an established fact to have killed our people in West Kingston. Something that could have been resolved diplomatically. But he result, you know, he decided that he would have used the coercion of the military. And after that incident, then we had this stringent austerity coming from the IMF. Well, I'll talk about that in a few. All right, so please let's let us listen to what Nigel Clark is saying. And so, and, and both what he did and what he probably, well, you can't reflect that we don't read just yet, but we will talk about that morning, sir. Welcome to Spy Jamaica. How are you, sir? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Devil, thanks for having me, Simone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I took this out because the headline says by Mr. Lance Nita, it says Jamaica needs Clark more than the IMF does. <laughs> and I read a paragraph. He says he has been an awesome minister of finance. Some say he is arguably the best. He displays confidence without swagger, is disciplined but not ascetic, charming but focused, and displays the all-important ability to explain his policies to any level of the population inclined to listen. I don't know if I ask if you agree with that, but... Uh, but is, is, is... Very kind words. I didn't see that article. I didn't see that. Yeah. Where, it was in what... Uh, the, the, the greener today. And, uh, today? I, yeah. Right, I didn't see it today. Lance Nita. Okay, but I think uh, most of us would... Yeah, I was asking though that is that true that he is able to explain po uh, policies to the ordinary Jamaican, you know, um, in a way that they understand what he's doing? I don't think that the, Dr. Nigel Clark was able to communicate clearly his policies to the Jamaican people. I think that he tended to have used hyperlute and very obscure terminologies that people were not really sure what he was talking about. He sounded very eloquent and very astute, but it was not effective communication in terms of explaining to the people why these policies are logical and how they are going to help us to move the economy along. I think what we heard more was that this economy is great and that we have great macroeconomics and the debt is going down, but people are not seeing that in their lives. What they're seeing are high prices at the supermarket, inflation that is out of whack, and a situation, an economic situation that they think that they have to flee. 
And that is why we have the second country that in terms of brain drain, we have many of our brightest minds leaving Jamaica because of the economic situation. Many of them are leaving, not because of the security, the national security. Some are leaving because of that, the national insecurity, I should say, but the large majority are leaving because of the economic situation in Jamaica and that they're not able to cope economically with the prices and with the fact that many of them can't even afford to buy a house. They can't afford to even pay rent. And we recently heard about electric bills. I don't think that Nigel Clark is are dealing with these basic fundamentals. And he's not explaining how the IMF is helping Jamaica to overcome these economic challenges. He has not yet been able to say that, to intimate, to articulate explicitly what is happening. Well, we really are in the dark as far as the IMF is concerned. But let him continue. I would agree with that, sir. Um, tell us what happened. How did this come about? Did they put it out and you applied for it? Did they just call you and say, we want to give you a position? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you frankly, I mean, I, it was over the summer. I was, uh, I got a, a text from the managing director of IMF that she wanted to talk. I thought she wanted to talk about burial. So, but you know, it's way after yeah. burial here. And so I said, sure, tomorrow morning I was, and, you know, I was driving to the country, I was driving to West Milan, which, you know, has some roots in West Milan. And on the way she called and we spoke about issues, spoke about Beryl and spoke about a lot of things. And then she uh, sort of uh, mentioned this opportunity and put it to me. Uh, that was just literally uh, several weeks ago. It's over the summer. Um, it was, and- Are you shocked? Caught off guard. I, I I I was I was certainly I was caught off guard for sure. Um, I I think it wasn't something I was expecting at that time. I have been presented with offers from Washington institutions. Shall we just keep it broadly like that? Before I mean I've had several offers before. Um, during very, ten years as me. Yes, during my ten years minister of finance. Okay. Yes, several. Uh, this would be the fourth. Okay, I've turned down the previous three. Uh, this, however, and those were significant uh, in terms of the uh, level of authority uh, and scope of responsibility. This, though, is a, at a different level, right? To be deputy manager director of at the IMF, a global institution, uh, is 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 something that you know, after reflection, as difficult as it was, I felt it was the right thing. Uh, to do, having a Jamaican being presented with an opportunity, I believe I have I, I, I got to go where no Jamaican has gone before, where no Caribbean person has gone before, where nobody from Central America has gone before, in one of the world's most preeminent financial institutions, I felt that I had a responsibility to take that up. Yeah. I have a twofold question out of that. Um, the first is, how much did you agonize? I heard one Jamaican... A journalist asking, why are you abandoning Jamaica? And I wonder if there are Jamaicans who see it that way. That's the first. The second is, being in this position, the anomalous position of being the first Jamaican, first Caribbean, first from, do, do you feel like a lot of people are looking at you now as a Jamaican? It's very interesting that we are talking about who is the first and the last, and but the first. We, we keep on, even the United States, we were talking about the first. And we know that if Kamala Harris is elected to becoming the next US president, that she's going to be the first in many ways of, you know, being the first Black and South Asian and woman president. But what does it bode for people when we talk about that? Do you think people care about who's president or who is president or deputy managing director of the IMF if they if that position cannot translate into effective policies, into policies that will improve? their well-being, their economic well-being. I don't think people care, right? These are just symbolisms. And I think that we need to move beyond that. And we need, of course, to congratulate these people. And we are happy for their personal success. But it's the same thing, like you say, in Bolt or, or athletes on the field. They are building their personal career. It's not building Jamaica. It's something that we have to understand. And I think that Jamaicans have not yet grasped that concept, that we have now to begin to come together 
as a collective to build Jamaica. But we cannot just rely on the symbolisms of our most astute academic people and intellectuals, and because they're working at Brown University and Harvard University, we think that this is going to, you know, bode you know well for the country and that it is going to help to uplift Jamaica. It doesn't, because when people go there, what they're seeing is a poor poverty-stricken country. They're not looking at Nigel Clark. I mean, and they might have heard about him. Perhaps I don't think they many because many Americans don't even know about the IMF, and they don't care about the IMF, even though they should. Right. And, you know, they're not having Usain Bolt in their, you know, in their heads every day. But when they go to the island and they see the level of poverty and the desperation of our people, that impression will always be there. So we've got to build the economy. We've got to really look at how we are going to develop ourselves, our infrastructure, and most importantly, invest in our human resources, which we have not yet begun to do. And if we have done it, it's very, it's, it's not very, it's not enough. Because what we're seeing is a country in which many people have been left behind. So this Dr. Clark going to the IMF means a lot to Dr. Clark and his family and, and maybe a few people, you know, a few other people, who, because the IMF is not going to take many Jamaicans there anyway. So even though that this might be a glass, what do you call it now? Uh, you know, he's going to be the first Jamaican or the first Caribbean or the first Central American to have gotten such a position. It doesn't mean, therefore, that this is going to be made the norm. This is more of the exception. And why are they choosing him? Because, of course, he was very effective in implementing austerity, which made people poor in Jamaica. Because these institutions, as Neville and Simone should have done. They should have done the research and asked him about the history of the IMF and how the IMF has ravaged economies around the world. But they're just there and they're fawning over him. And this is this great, you know, um, finance minister who is one of the best that Jamaica has ever seen. And he's not. He's not going to be the best finance minister that Jamaica has ever seen. And we should know that. But I think we're lying to ourselves, lying to Dr. Nigel Clark, and he knows that we're lying to him. But he, you know, who doesn't like to be praised and to be lauded for the efforts, even when we know that it is not true. And that is what he's doing right now. And to, to do things <laughs> for Jamaica, almost like, you know, you're looking out for us in particular, because that's not really a practical. Yes. So the front, you remember as well, this is the this is the highest position that a non-EU citizen can get, right? By convention, the International Monetary Fund, a, a EU citizen is the managing director. That's what's convention for the last eight years. So the highest position that a non-EU citizen can have in this preeminent global financial institution is that of deputy managing director. So to put that in the context. Um the you asked a question about um Oh, yes, so, so the IMF is owned by 190 countries. It serves 190 countries. Its larger shareholders clearly are the Western democracies. Uh, the fund, as the managing director has pointed out, wants to focus on you know, ensuring that uh, lesser developed countries, uh, small economies, uh, island states uh, have the opportunity to have stable economies and to grow and to develop. And that, you know, will require uh, innovation uh, while sticking to the, the core principles of the fund. And I believe that, you know, the managing director uh, wants to uh, sort of uh, provide an environment where the members of the fund can be served even better than they are now. And my addition to the management team uh, is 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 seen as supportive of that mission. I mentioned something from the Greener, and now this is the editorial from the Observer. I think it was a couple of days ago. Effectively, as you were saying, there's only one deputy managing director position in the IMF open for the rest of the world, inclusive of Brazil, Mexico, Nigeria, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, India, Indonesia, and more than 150 other countries. That this position should be offered to a Jamaican 
and approved by the IMF executive board in the context of Jamaica's politically minuscule 0.1 percent. <laughs> yeah, 0.1 percent <laughs> shareholding is therefore of, of foreign. You know, Jamaica to the world. Again, they're giving Jamaicans this illusion that, you know, Nigel Clark's Nigel Clark going to the IMF is going to, you know, he's going to transform the institution and that we're going to have some influence. But we're not going to have any influence whatsoever because our economy, again, we are not respected on the global stage in terms of our economy. We don't produce anything. Um, we do not invent anything, really. So who respects us? Nigel Clark is just going to go there to do the bidding as a wonderful house Negro of the International Monetary Fund. He's not going there to transform the institution as it were. He's there to cement the policies and more so to give us the illusion if he should recommend policy for Jamaica, Jamaicans are going to believe that he's trying to do the best for us when Perhaps he's not, and he will not. He's going to be do, doing any policy that Nigel Clark implements or suggests that Jamaica implement when he goes to Washington will be in the best interest of the IMF and not in the best interest of Jamaica. Something we need to understand. But I don't think Jamaicans understand the, the whole motive and the purpose of the IMF and the history, as it were, of the IMF. And this is a progressive history. We have to look at how the IMF also has evolved as an institution since it came into being in the 1940s, because it's not the same institution like what it was founded to have been, even though in the first place it was then a great institution, but it had, I would say, more noble aspirations and more noble motive than you know, when it came now in the decades of the 1970s, and we had the oil crisis, move into the de decades of the 1980s and 90s and this rigid austerity and it's all you know it, it's rigidity to this you know free market capitalism which is not helping Jamaica because free market does not mean the market is free right it's more of an enslaved market and something that we have to understand something that we have to grasp. significance. Mm, um, I, I know you as a humble person, but this this must leak off your head. <laughs> no, it, it, it is. I mean, people have been making much of the fact that there are four deputy managing directors, yes. <laughs> but the management structure of the IMF reflects its ownership structure. As I mentioned, the EU states own 24% of the fund. And so by convention, they've always had a managing director role. The United States and China are the next two largest shareholders. The United States, China, and Japan are the next three largest shareholders, if you count the EU as a block. And the United States has 16.5%, so they always have a, a managing director, the first managing director, deputy managing director spot. The China and Japan have 6% each, uh, and they always have uh, two deputy managing director spots reserved for them. So the three of the deputy managing director spots go to the US citizen, a Japanese citizen and a Chinese citizen by convention. There's only one deputy manager director spot over for the rest of the entire world, which includes all of those countries mentioned. We'll be talking about the rest of 186 countries yeah, right. in the world. Yeah, right. So yes, it uh, you know uh, others have political weight to support their candidacy. Uh, Jamaica with, as you said, 0.1 percent uh, share has no political weight to support. So it's it's all based on other stuff, yeah. which. Okay, so he is, you know, acknowledging that Jamaica does not have any political weight in determining, and I would say economic weight also in determining the policies of the IMF, something that we have to understand. But, you know, I, I found it very interesting that neither Simone nor Neville, you know, read an article to give them some amount of understanding of how the IMF functions. It's just reading the Jamaica Observer and the Jamaica Gleaner and reading the glowing reports and the praises that are being, you know, hurled upon um, Dr. Nigel Clark. Now, this was a book written by Charles, um, 
Chalmers Johnson, um, Nemesis. It's another book written by him, Nemesis, The Last Days of the American Republic. That was written by Chalmers Johnson. And on page 64, he writes something about the IMF, but he's linking the IMF to the US military industrial complex. And that, you know, the United States military and the IMF and the World Bank, they work together. Right, and something that we have to understand. But let's look at page 163, the last paragraph, and read this to you for you to understand. Just get a little understanding and insight into what the IMF is all about. Most citizens of Latin America, let me just read that again. Most citizens of Latin American countries know about our armed interventions to overthrow popularly supported governments in Guatemala. That was 1954. And all of these governments, by the way, are because they just wanted to implement progressive policies, progressive economic policies that would have improved the lives of their people. Not because they were so great, just because they just wanted to share some of the economic, the natural resources um, with the people, the wealth of the country. Cuba in 1961, Dominican Republic in 1965, Chile in 1973, Grenada in 1983 and Nicaragua 1984 to 1990. Many know about Fort Benning, School of the Americas, where they torture, you know, they literally learn how to torture people. So many um, know about Fort Benning, School of the Americas, the U.S. Army's infamous military academy that specializes in training that American officers in state terrorism and repression. Right? That is what they're known to do there in Atlanta, in Georgia, Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. It was renamed the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Corporation in 2000 to try to disguise its past. And that's what they always do. Some are aware of the 1997 creation of the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies within the National Defense University in Washington to indoctrinate Latin American civilian defense officials, as well as the Pentagon's endless efforts to create close military to military relations by sending US special forces to train and arm Latin American armies. And listen to what he's saying here. And he's linking the IMF and the World Bank and the IDB and the World Trade Organization to US imperialism. Look at what he does here, which is very brilliant. Finally, there is a steadfast advocacy of radical free market capitalism that when implemented by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization have invariably left Latin American countries more indebted and poverty stricken than they were before. Let me read it again, because having looked at what the military does and the World Bank works symbiotically with the with the um with the military because if you do not accede to what the imf and the world bank and the world trade organization desires or desire then the military is going to show up they're going to create a pretext that's what they do they're not going to go and say wow jamaica didn't want to follow the imf and their austere their austere policies they will look at something else and create a pretext for invasion and they always can create pretext because, you know, the American media is strong and is also supported by the national security state. All right. So this is what happens. So he says here that finally, very brilliant point. There is the steadfast advocacy of radical free market capitalism that when implemented by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization have invariably left Latin American countries more indebted. So you're hearing about, you know, this, you know, um, macroeconomic stability and that our debt is being reduced, but it leaves us more indebted and poverty stricken than they were before. But it is subtle, right? It is, co it is done covertly that you are not seeing what these guys are doing. But because they are so brilliant, and Nigel Clark said, you know, if if we had the time to listen to the entire interview, he said most of the people at the IMF, they're very well trained. They have PhDs in economics and all sort of probably finance and other, you know, um, careers. But they're very well trained, so they use the best minds to deceive you. 
And you've got to use your brain. You've got to study the psychology and the, the, the mechanisms that they use to control your minds. So it looks good. It looks like these guys are dressed well and they speak well and they, of course, have very impressive degrees coming from outstanding universities. But do they mean you well? And are they telling you the truth? Now, let me just read this before I end this video coming from the Financial Times. And this is actually about the IMF program that Jamaica was forced to go into. And they are explaining, and I can't read everything, but you have to go, I will, you know, add this in the description box below, and you can read it for yourselves. And this is part two coming from the Financial uh, Times, right? And the Financial Times, by the way, is a very conservative newspaper. So it's not that it's anti-IMF, but they are revealing that they're more pro-IMF, right? And the free market capitalism but they're actually showcasing what the IMF did in Jamaica. Now, they're talking about Jamaica is no stranger to economic pain. And in 2012, local officials feared that a complete collapse was looming. Government debt was spiraling higher. The economy was moribund and desperate attempts to lobby for another international monetary fund bailout appeared to be failing. But Jamaica's fortunes began to turn in the new year, and what followed was nothing short of an economic miracle. That's what they're saying. That's a miracle. But look at how we arrived at that miracle. And now let's look at what they say here in the second paragraph, because sometimes we think that we're so wealthy. The optics of letting poor, predominantly Black country, a poor, predominantly Black country, so that's how they see us, right? That is a poor predominantly Black country collapse at the time when the IMF was bailing out wealthier European countries. But under, on, under what conditions were they bailing out these countries? On more generous terms than they had usually imposed on developing economies were toxic, and that's what they do. They, they actually impose more generous terms, right? The, it's not as austere. The austerity is not as intense as they have or that as they force up on poor countries, particularly what they call black countries. Moreover, the fund was trying to win US approval for more resources that made ensuring political support from Maxine Waters, head of Congress's Financial Services Committee and her colleagues imperative. Now, there was something um, that I wanted to read here. Now, in January 2012, a bunch of senior IMF officials met in the, uh, in the office of uh, Siddharth Titiwari, when the head of its strategy policy and review department to thrash out the details of a potential Jamaican program. This is one of the fund's most powerful arms, a kind of internal police force, because it is a kind of internal police force that oversees all its programs around the world from Washington. So Washington makes the decision, not Jamaica. So if you think that, you know, Nigel Clark was in Jamaica calling the shots, I want to let you know that it is otherwise. And they will groom him very well over there. For, and they will indoctrinate him very well. And don't be surprised when he comes back, to, well, when he goes to Jamaica, not to live necessarily, but to impose stringent and austerity stringent policies and austere policies upon the culture, upon the economy. Now, they looked at what might be needed and concluded that for another program to be remotely feasible, Jamaica had to undergo another tougher debt restructuring and commit to running a 7.5% primary budget surplus before interest payments are deducted for the foreseeable future. Now, hear this. Although Jamaica was already running a 5.2% surplus, so we were running a 52 under Golding the Pairs. This was astonishingly high. At the time, even Greece was only required to hit 4.5%, and they were crying. And they were more indebted than Jamaica was at the time. And only by 2016. To Peter Doyle, a former IMF veteran who has become an ardent critic of the fund. So this is a guy who was, used to work at the IMF. 
and he is complaining. He is a critic of the IMF, of the institution. It was akin to macroeconomic malpractice. What they did was fraudulent in Jamaica and should never have happened, right? To macroeconomic malpractice, given how it could stunt growth. So even the former IMF employee suggested that this stringent IMF policy could have stunted growth, which it did, right? Because our economy has not grown, you know, significantly since we went into the, I mean, for decades, but more so when we went um, and became, you know, we had to accede to the IMF austerity. We have not grown much. I think it was ridiculous, he says, and I still do. Doyle says, it's why Jamaican programs have been such a problem. They're so hostile to economic growth, right? This is coming from a former IMF employee. Now, why has Nigel Clark not understood that, right? He is this mathematician, right? He, he has, he's a Rhodes Scholar. And why has he not been able to acknowledge, right, this sort of truthful reality? And why are we praising him for overseeing one of the most austere programs of the IMF? Why are we doing it? Why are we doing it, Jamaica? It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to come to full grip with the reality that the IMF has not really helped us to grow. Our economy it has been stunted. We're, we're regressing as a people. We're reg and that is why our people are leaving. They're leaving in droves. They're leaving en masse to other countries in search of a better life. Because, and we keep on lying to ourselves. And what is going to happen? We're going to lie to ourselves until the entire economy comes crumbling down? And we're already, uh, you know, an insecure. We have an insecure environment. So what happens when the entire economy comes down, comes falling down? What's going to happen? The crime and violence definitely is going to go up astronomically. And who are we going to blame? We have nobody to blame but ourselves because the IMF is not going to even look at us. And they're not going to sympathize with us. And let's not forget that the IMF went to Jamaica and, you know, fleeced billions of dollars from the National Housing Trust. Right? They fleeced that. And that should have been illegal. Should have been illegal. But our government allowed them to do that, and the citizens did not really protest, right? Because you believe the government is doing it in your best interest when it's not doing so, right? Because the IMF is, as they know, they're afraid because they know that the IMF and the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, they're all tied to the US military industrial complex and that they can create pretext to invade Jamaica and to depose their government. So we laud while we laud Nigel Clark on this important position in his personal life, in his personal career, we laud him for that. I, you know, I have no, don't call me and tell me that I'm bad man because I'm happy for him as an individual, but we can't extricate him from the policies that he has implemented that will affect how many people living there? Three million people. Now and generations to come. Right? This is not a, just an individual. This is a public servant who made decisions not only for himself, but for the entire country, economic decisions. And you, you can't just say that, you know, you're just going to, wow, that he's packing, packing up and going. This is not somebody who's a private citizen that we can say, wow, yes, we're happy. If Nigel Clark had not been a public servant, it would, I'll be happy for him. 
right? As a, you know, I would be happy for him. But he was in that position for years and he has made very important decisions that would have affected our economy and that will continue to affect our, our economy in years to come, right? So why are we not sitting down now and looking carefully, analyzing objectively what are some of these policies? And we heard about the 7.5 budgetary primary surplus, uh, primary you know, surplus that we had to run in 2012. Where are we now? Are we running a surplus of what? A primary surplus of what? Six? Five? Nobody knows. Now, if Greece could be complaining, and Greece is a richer country and more developed country than Jamaica, far more developed, and they were complaining of their 4.5 primary surplus, what says a poor poverty-stricken country like Jamaica? And they imposed the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, imposed a 7.5 primary surplus upon Jamaicans, right? They had absolutely no conscience. And these are the people that Dr. Nigel Clark will be going to work for. People without any moral conscience, without any sense of moral compass. We have to wake up. We've got to wake up. We've got to wake up because Nigel Clark is just the face of an imperial economic institution called the IMF. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you'll share and you'll subscribe. I look forward to seeing you in another video. Make sure that you watch the video and you also like the video so the video can be shared to as many people on the platform. Ciao.